which I apologize, I was just getting overly mic'd. Uh, I, I will tell you, by the way, after you're done with your training program, if you want to stick around, uh, I'm going to tape Huckabee's show from right out here. Now, it's actually fairly boring because you only get to see one half of it. And all it is is a guy sitting staring into a camera, but sometimes people like to watch and see how remote shots are done. So if you want to stay, we're happy to have you stay. And I know Mike would be happy to have you stay. Talk to him yesterday. I, I'm just going to say a couple of quick things, and then I want to uh, toss it open for questions from you, because I'm very supportive of the Tea Party movement. I should introduce Adam Waldeck, who's right here. Adam is our Tea Party coordinator, and we've, been, we've had meetings with well over a 1,000 Tea Party leaders around the country. We just had a lunch in Atlanta this week with about uh, 30, 35 leaders from all over the state of Georgia. So I'm delighted to be here and to be supportive of what you're doing. I think there are three overarching challenges that are going to define 2012. And the three come together in a way that makes this, I think, in some ways, the most decisive election since 1860 in defining who we are as a country. The first is just economics. How do we create jobs? How do we get the value of housing back up so that, you know, right now one out of every four houses is worth less than its mortgage? And you've got to have economic growth to get the value of housing back up. You've got to have economic growth to have jobs. And so the question becomes, what's the path that gets us there? And if you look at the Reagan years, uh, as a very young congressman, I worked with Jack Kemp and Art Laffer and others, and we developed a concept of really creating jobs by encouraging businesses and encouraging innovators and encouraging entrepreneurs. And it basically came down to tax cuts and deregulation and American energy and encouraging people, saying nice things about people who create jobs, which turned out to be psychologically really important. And Reagan implemented that plan. <coughs> We were in total mess. Those of you who are old enough remember that we had gasoline rationing, where you bought, you only got to buy gasoline every other day based on the last number of your license plate. We had 13% inflation, 22% interest rates. We were sliding into the deepest recession since the Great Depression. And Reagan came in, instituted his plan. By October of 1982, it began to turn around. In the next seven years, if you apply the Reagan period to, the, to today's economy and today's population, it would be the equivalent of adding over the next seven years 25 million new jobs, $4 trillion, $400 billion additional gross domestic product every year, which would then lead to $800 billion a year of greater federal revenue with no tax increases. Because if you take somebody who's out of work, drawing food stamps, on unemployment, on welfare, on Medicaid, and you transfer them over here and they get a job, they're taking care of their family, they're actually paying taxes. That's the biggest single step you can take towards a balanced budget. It dramatically reduces the cost of government, and it increases revenue with no tax increase because people go back to work. So we know how to do that, and it's dramatically the opposite of the Obama policies which are basically the reason we're in the longest, deepest, I think it's a depression. If you have 14 million people out of work and, and you've had a, a deeper slide in housing prices than in the Great Depression, then I think it's fair to say that this is the Obama depression. And the fact is, the way you get out of it is almost exactly opposite his policies. So in my case, I'm advocating no tax increase in 2013 because tax increases fill jobs. And you'll notice, by the way, even today they're arguing in Washington because they want a tax increase as part of the debt ceiling. And they, they don't, they just literally, as socialists, they don't get it. Tax increases kill jobs. So no tax increase. Second, zero capital gains tax so that you have hundreds of billions of dollars pouring into the United States to invest because we'd be the best place in the world to create new jobs. A 12.5% corporate tax rate, which, by the way, ironically for liberals, we would get more money out of General Electric at 12.5% than we're currently getting at 35%. Because at 35%, they hire enough lawyers to avoid all the taxes. They pay virtually nothing. But at 12.5%, they'd fire the lawyers and pay the taxes. Because it would be cheaper to pay the taxes. That would bring about a trillion dollars of capital 
from overseas that's currently locked up because companies won't bring it home to pay a 35% tax rate. But they bring it home at 12 and a half. I would be for 100% expensing, which affects every farmer, it affects every small business, it affects everybody. If you buy equipment, you could write it off in one year. And our goal would be to make America the most successful place in the world uh, in terms of the best equipment, the newest equipment, so our workers are the most productive. And, and finally, I would abolish the death tax permanently so that family-owned businesses could focus on job creation, not on tax avoidance. Those steps would be a big help. On deregulation, as Reagan did, I'd repeal the Dodd-Frank bill, which is a job-killing bill, a small business-killing bill, a bill which is killing small banks. It's, and it's, uh, first of all, if I just tell you, it's Dodd and Frank. You probably don't need to know a great deal more detail to know it's a good bill to repeal. But it, it, I think it's important for us to clean the plate. Just as I think we should repeal Obamacare, not try to fix it, but get rid of it completely, because I don't think it's fixable. Finally, uh, I would, uh, two of the last things, I would repeal the Sarbanes-Oxley bill, which has killed smaller businesses and made it very difficult for businesses to grow into being public companies. And I would replace the Environmental Protection Agency with a brand new Environmental Solutions Agency fundamentally designed to cooperate with local communities, cooperate with state governments, and cooperate with business to bring together both a good economy and a good environment, but not to have anti-business, anti-local control, Washington-based regulators who are basically trying to control the rest of us through regulation and bureaucracy. So that, that I think, would lead to economic growth. Second, I think we need to reassert American exceptionalism. You know, when NBC News edits out under God in the Pledge of Allegiance, you know, you know how sick our elites have gotten. When you have a judge in Texas, I just did a, I do a newsletter, I just did a newsletter this week on Judge Barry. And Judge Barry this week, uh, Judge Barry on June 1st issued an order that said, not only could students not pray at their graduation, they could not use the word prayer, they could not use the word benediction, they could not ask people to rise. He had like seven things they couldn't do that, frankly, are speech police, as though this was some kind of a totalitarian dictatorship. And my response is very simple and very different, because I'm a historian. I believe that Judge Barry should meet Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, in 1802, passed the Judicial Reform Act of 1802. Now, Jefferson had as his Secretary of State James Madison. So you have to assume Jefferson knew a fair amount about the Constitution. The Reform Act of 1802 abolishes 18 out of 35 federal judges. Doesn't, doesn't impeach them. Doesn't go through any kind of you have to be guilty. It just says your office is closed. We're not paying for it. You're not getting a salary. Go home. Now, the, several of the 18 judges who lost their jobs tried to file a lawsuit to claim it was unconstitutional. The other judges said to them, are you crazy? If we agree to hear your lawsuit, they're going to abolish our judgeship. So I believe that the Congress, I mean, I think a judge who issues an order that says they will put you in jail if you say the word prayer shouldn't be a judge. Right. part of why I decided to run for president. Because as a historian who has been Speaker of the House, I know that the American people have remedies for a court which has run amok. Now, I used to talk about the Ninth Circuit. I used to tell people I would not be as bold as Jefferson. I would not try to abolish half of all the federal judges. I would limit it to the Ninth Circuit as a demonstration of that. <laughs> but I'll tell you now, I think that Judge Barry is so indefensible that this Congress this year should, should, should abolish his job, force the president to confront, is the president prepared to say it's okay to have judges impose a judicial dictatorship and have speech law issued by judges who threaten to put you in jail for saying the word prayer? And this is a defining moment in America. We're either gonna become a secular European socialist society or we're gonna say we're tired of this stuff. And we, and, we, and we insist on having judges who respect American history, and we insist on having presidents who understand American history. Remember, this president four times now 
failed to say the words endowed by our creator even when they were on the telephone. So the fundamental distinction, the reason I'm, I say this, this is the second big issue after economics is, is very, I know this makes me sound like I'm some kind of academic guy, but I'm not. This is central to who we are. We are the only country in the history of the world that says you are personally endowed by your creator. Power comes from God to each one of you personally. The power, that power, by the way, is unalienable, meaning no judge, no bureaucrat, no politician can take it away from you. The center of American society is the citizen, not the government. And if we give up on that, and we have a president right now who is absolutely on the other side of this issue. We have a president who recently cited the United Nations and the Arab League for why we're in Libya. Now, the Arab League is a collection of dictators and monarchs. The United Nations is a corrupt institution which just elected Iran to the vice presidency of the General Assembly. The idea that an American president would cite an unconstitutional precedent of doing something because of two international organizations, neither of which have anything to do with America, should, should frankly frighten every American. So I think the second big issue is very simple. The first issue is you want to create jobs. I'd like to be the paycheck president. Obama is the best food stamp president in American history. I'd like to go into every neighborhood in Iowa and say to people of every background, would you rather have paycheck for your children or food stamps for your children? Let's just draw the line. I know how to create paychecks. I did it with Ronald Reagan. We did it in 1994. We brought, when I was speaker, we brought the unemployment rate from 5.6% to under 4% shortly after I left the speaker's office. We balanced the federal budget for four years. We know, and we balanced it while cutting taxes to create economic growth, not trying to raise taxes to kill jobs. Second, I think the choice is going to be clear. Do you want an American government based on American exceptionalism that follows the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Federalist Papers, or do you want some fancy you know, intellectual European socialist model that is radically different? And the choice is going to be that way. And then lastly, you want a strong homeland and national security system that defends America, or do you want a policy that gets us in three wars with no strategy, has no explanation of what we're doing, has no explanation of victory, and refuses to even describe who our enemies are? Is that clear choice? I would say one last thing. I am committed to controlling the border, and I have a very simple step for those of you who wonder how you would do it. And as a historian, I'll tell you, of course you can control the border. It's a matter of willpower, organization, and resources. <laughs> I have a very simple model. Take half the people in the Department of Homeland Security bureaucracy in Washington. Move them to Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona, and you have more than enough people to control the border without adding any cost to the federal government. And it's a question of what you think your priorities are. The current priorities are paperwork. I think the priorities are to be controlling the border. It's that simple. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I think the Tea Party movement is very important because it is mobilizing citizens who have not been active in politics, and it is focusing on the basics, getting us back to being American again. And what I'd like to do, if I can, is uh, answer questions and give you a chance. Uh, we're going to have, um, sorry, one second. We're going to take some questions from the crowd. Please state your name, and, um, and we're going to repeat it for you, and let Mr. Gingrich go ahead and ask them. And, uh, We'll introduce Mr. Owens in a second. So go ahead, sir, with the, the student. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. King. My, my name is Michael Nolay, uh, Melcher, Dallas, Iowa. And you mentioned Judge Roy Berry in Texas. I think I know an easier way to defang him, actually. It involves the pardon power. Simply announced to the school district that if they put, that if they can put prayer in if they want, and if the court uh, finds them in contempt, they'll just use the pardon power to void and, and any sentence, any fine. Same thing, Roy. Judge Roy Romer in Alabama, you must put the Ten Commandments up, tell George Romer you'll lose the pardon power to void everything. Just to repeat, he's asking about the pardon power. That is actually a brilliant idea. <laughs> no, that, 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 you're right, a new president. One of my projects is called On the First Day. And, and the idea is that right after the inaugural address, you would take an hour break, and on C-SPAN, you would sign somewhere between 50 and 200 executive orders that would immediately change the pattern of the government that, as of that moment. The first executive order would be to eliminate all the White House czars as of that moment. I'm going to go back, and we're, we're putting together a team to really look at potential executive orders. 
I want to look at whether or not we could, by executive order, announce that anyone who did the following things would, would be automatically pardoned yep. as an interim step until you finish cleaning out the judges. Might this be uh, an undiscovered check and constitutional check and balance? It, well, no, it's not undiscovered. It's unused. Hmm. If you, the, I, I taught a course a couple of years ago at the University of Georgia Law School. And, and if, if you go back, and I wrote a book called Rediscovering God in America, and I've written several other books, that have, I, including my newest one, The Nation Like No Other, and all of these basically go back and pick up what the Founding Fathers intended. They thought about all this. The, and then in Federalist 78, Alexander Hamilton writes, the judiciary is the weakest of the three branches. If you had said that there was a Supreme Court, they'd have laughed at you. They said the court is supreme among courts, representing the weakest of the three branches. But the legislature was not designed to be the, dicta the dictatorial branch. The legislature was designed, I mean, the, the, the judiciary was designed to be a relatively weak branch, which would only adjudicate laws as developed by the court, the Congress, and the president. So I, and, they, and they did have the, the pardon power for that reason. Uh, although I think, I think it would be more salutary in shifting the entire judiciary to eliminate one or two judges and indicate we are prepared to take on anti-religious judges because they are fundamentally anti-American. Any other questions? Yes, yes, sir. Jim Altman from Indianola. If you were to assume the presidency today, what would you do with Libya? The question was, what would he do, what would he do with Libya if he were to assume the presidency today? Uh, I, think it's a, I think that's a hard question for this reason. I think our intelligence is so bad and the laws that Congress has adopted since the mid-1970s have so undermined our intelligence. But the truth is we don't know who the rebels are in Benghazi. Libya was the, lead, the number two producer of anti-American foreign fighters in Iraq. More, more people came from Libya than any other country with Saudi Arabia to kill Americans. The, the leading city that produced anti-American fighters was Benghazi. So we don't know whether we're currently actively helping replace Gaddafi, who should go, with somebody who's even worse. And the truth is, we don't know. And so I'm very cautious. I, I think we need to rethink the entire region, because I think our, I mean, just think about Pakistan. All, you know, I, I used to be one of the eight people who was briefed in the legislative branch on all of our most basic secrets. And I then spent years working as an advisor to the CIA after I stepped down, and, and going out and talking with them and doing things with them on a regular basis. I think there was a general assumption that bin Laden was hiding in a cave in Waziristan in northwest Pakistan. If you had said to people in the intelligence community, oh no, he's in a large compound in a military city one mile from the National Defense University, they would have said to you, that could only be happening with the active support of elements of the Pakistani government. Yet what did the Pakistani government do when we found him? They didn't go out and root out the people who were hiding him. They went out and arrested the people who were helping America. Now, if our intelligence is so bad that after $20 billion in Pakistan since 9-11, we don't even know, we didn't even know that the Pakistani intelligence service was apparently protecting bin Laden, I'm very cautious about what I would do in Libya right now. I mean, I think you have, we need a fundamental rethinking. I think the Congress <coughs> needs to pass a law liberating our intelligence services allowing them to go back candidly to being spies, getting them out of the embassies and in the field again. Uh, and we need to recognize how little we understand the region right now. I think, I think we're not in good shape anywhere in the region, and I think that our lack of understanding of the region, and, and this is not an Obama comment, this is truly the entire American establishment. It goes all the way back to, to the Bush years and earlier. But we have been underestimating how hard this is. So I, I'd be cautious. I, I would not, I will promise you this though, if I'm president, you will never get a message to the Congress from me that cites the United Nations as my authority for using American forces anywhere on the planet. Uh, all right, ma'am, right there. It's always good to be charitable and to assume people, when you talk about religion, 
are who they say they are. I mean, he, he clearly belonged to a Christian church. As you'll remember, his pastor was actually pretty controversial. But we, we have pretty good proof he belonged to the church. They, they were married in the church. Uh, their children go to Sunday school. Uh, so so my I think it's fair to say he is a Christian. I mean, I, I happen to think some of his views of Islam are a fantasy. Uh, but that's an, that's an intellectual view. I, 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 I take him at his word, and I take him at his actions. And so I think it would be... Uh, inappropriate to suggest anything else, uh, which is different than what do I think about his attitude towards Islam, which I think involves a very high level of self-delusion. Kim Schmidt, uh, Congressman, we're been sending billions of dollars overseas to some of those terrorist nations that would be buy oil. Uh, China is holding a huge amount of our national debt. What do we need to do to get uh, control of our economy and energy? Sure. You want that? I'll repeat it again. Uh, no, no, this, no, you make the TV happy. Yay. Oh, I'm not nearly as happy as you. Okay. You make my boss happy. So anyway, he asked a little bit about what we're going to do to get control of our spending and debt. Um, mentioned China, and he mentioned sending money out to the uh, Middle Eastern countries. So. Yeah, let, let me draw that into, into three different pieces for a second, because it's a very important question. I am deeply committed to an American energy policy. And one of the things I guarantee you if I'm the nominee is you'll see a commercial next year in the general election that shows President Obama in Brazil saying to the Brazilians, I'm really glad you're drilling offshore. And I'm really glad we could have $2 billion in loan guarantees so you could buy equipment to drill offshore, by the way, for a George Soros company. And then he went on to say the most extraordinary thing. I hope we can be your best customer. And I don't think he gets it. We don't hire a president to be a purchasing agent for foreign countries. We hire a president to be a salesman for American products. And if he'd said, I hope you'll be our best customer, that would have made some sense. <laughs> so first of all, the Obama model, which is to borrow from the Chinese in order to pay the Brazilians. You know, there's no 16-year-old in the state who would think that's a sustainable model. You have, you have to go to Harvard. Uh, in order to have this kind of sophisticated appreciation of the world. Second, his policies in the Gulf, uh, in, in uh, of, of Mexico, have cut production by 20% from where they were projected to be. So that one estimate is, you know, they're, they're releasing some oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. The estimate is they stopped four and a half times as much production as they're releasing. The, amount of the lawsuits and the regulations and the red tape and the EPA in off Alaska, not, not the wilderness area, in an area that is already certified for oil that has 20 billion barrels called the Chukchi Sea, Shell just gave up $3 billion in investment because they got so frustrated they decided it was hopeless. That's 20, you know, he's releasing 30 million barrels. There are 20 billion barrels just off Alaska that we could be getting. The Bakken and Shale in, in, in formation in North Dakota is producing oil and gas, has, has reduced, by the way, this is a hint for the future, has reduced North Dakota unemployment to 3.5%. But EPA is not approving the pipelines we need to move oil and gas from the new formations to where it needs to be. So once again, we're being strangled by an anti-American energy administration. So I just give you those as examples. I am for drilling. I'm for oil, I'm for gas, I'm for the use of coal where we have the largest supply on the planet. We have more, we have more energy in coal than Saudi Arabia has in oil. I am for the use of wind power. I just flew in over a whole bunch of, uh, I think 14% of the electricity in Iowa now comes from wind. Uh, and, and apparently unlike Cape Cod, the farmers here don't seem to mind being paid to have a wind uh, uh, production on their, on their properties. Um, I am for uh, nuclear where it's appropriate, and I think the next generation of nuclear power plants are going to be smaller and simpler and safer and more stable than the, than the ones you see in Japan. And I think that's, that's a step in the right direction. I'm also for ethanol, and, and, I'm, and I'm for biological fuels. Uh, and I'm for biological fuels for a practical reason. If my choice is to have $5 billion go to Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, and Iran, or have the same $5 billion go to Illinois, Iowa, and South Dakota, just as a common sense practical matter, why wouldn't you prefer to have the money here producing fuel rather than there? Now, I think you're going to see that the tax subsidy is going to go away. 
But I'm told by the experts in the industry that if you have flex fuel cars and if you have flex pumps, and, and, and people are allowed to make a choice as customers, that when oil gets above a certain price, the fact is ethanol is very competitive. And so I think you, you know, I, I first voted for gas alcohol, as it was then called, in 1964, 1984, and Reagan signed it. And, and so this goes back a long way. It was a deliberate effort to find new sources of fuel to get us off of Saudi Arabia and Iran and Iraq and places like that. So, but I'm for an all of the above strategy. Don't, don't pick winners and losers. Encourage the development of every kind of American energy. The last piece is simple. If our economy grows and we balance our budget, we pay off our debt to the Chinese. If our economy doesn't grow and we don't balance our budget, the Chinese will basically control this country by control of our debt. That's, how, that's why I think 2012 is the most important election since 1860 in defining our future as a country. I'm going to bring up William Owens with Tea Party Review Magazine. He's got, we're live streaming right now, so make sure you text, tweet, tell people so they can see the Speaker of the House. And William Owens will talk to you a little bit about that and talk to Mr. Greenberg. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> My name is William Owens, publisher of the Tea Party Review Magazine. We'd like to give a shout out to our live stream audience. We want to thank you all for coming out today. How many tea parties do we have in here? Very good, very good, fantastic. Uh, tea Party Review Magazine has been out now for about um, four months. This is our latest edition, so be sure to go online and request a copy. It's the only national magazine in the company. Have you all enjoyed Newt so far today? Yeah. Fantastic. This is speakers, a pleasure to share with you today. And, and, and as you know, the Tea Party community is a tough community. And so I have some tough questions from you that's been submitted by Tea Party leader, leaders throughout the country. Um, at this point, uh, one of the questions that uh, one of our leaders has for you is this. In fact, this is my question from Tea Party Review Magazine. We've been hearing in the news some of the issues facing your current campaign. Um, it's causing some pause amongst Tea Party leaders throughout the country. Can you let us know what the current health condition of your campaign right now is? Sure. Sure. Let me say, first of all, uh, anybody who wants to can go to newt.org. Um, just my first name, and they can see what we're doing and see how we're doing it. Um, this is actually a Tea Party kind of story. I had a fundamental disagreement with consultants because I think we're in so much trouble that we need a very serious campaign about very big solutions that is totally different from the kind of campaign where it's a 30 second attack ad and it's all the normal stuff. And so I want to run a campaign which is based on ideas, based on meetings like this, based on the internet. And where, as I did Wednesday at the Atlanta Press Club, I outlined step by step, and you can see it if you go to uh, newt.org, I outlined on, on Wednesday two major steps towards a healthy America. Auditing the Federal Reserve, and reforming the Federal Reserve and taking all the banking powers out of the Federal Reserve and returning it to the single job of keeping the value of the dollar stable so that the dollar is worth the same 25 years from now as it is today. And second, repealing the Dodd-Frank bill because it is a job-killing bill. I'm, I, you'll see me make a series of speeches, all of them designed to have real solutions and to reach out to people at a personal level and say, is this, is this the kind of future you want? Well, that's very different from the consultant model of the candidate's job is to raise the money to pay the consultant to make the 30 second commercial. And that's not who I am. I, I helped Reagan in 1979, 1980. We ran an ideas oriented campaign and it changed history. I helped design the 1994 Contract with America campaign. It was an ideas oriented positive campaign and it got the largest increase in one party vote in American history for an off year, nine million extra votes. I'm willing to gamble, and, and our campaign is going to survive, and I'm going to be in it all the way, and I believe I can win it, because I believe we're in enough trouble that people want substance more than they want baloney, and I think that they want somebody who will look them in the eye, talk to them about serious solutions, answer questions, and learn, as we did today, with new ideas and new approaches, so that this campaign becomes a mutual education over the next year. It's not static, it's not, I believe this, and my consultants focus grouped it, and I've memorized these three phrases. It is a genuine conversation with the American people, and I actually believe we'll win the nomination, and I think we will beat Obama by a big margin. Yeah. Speaker, I, I grew up working hard. My dad worked hard. My son, I make him work hard. Uh, four children, married 25 years. 
I have a question. Principally speaking, what seems to be the problem with our leadership today in government? What is the core issue of why some of the issues are taking place in the American people? Campaign after campaign puts their trust in representatives only to be disappointed. What is the principal challenge? That, that, look, that's a very profound question. And, and it, it really comes to the heart of all of our experiences. When, when I was elected speaker, um, election night, we had a bunch of, it was, this was a huge moment. I mean, there had been no Republican speaker in 40 years. <coughs> Nobody in Washington thought I was going to be speaker. This is part of why when the talking heads say things, I ignore them. I mean, two weeks before the election of 1994, the two smartest analysts in Washington both said, the most the Republicans can get is 26 seats. Now, they were off by 100%. We picked up 53. 